good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. You guys a pretty good turnout here today. My name is Phil Wallace. I'm with Kiewit, um, chairman of the Federal Facilities Program for ABC. Today we're here for our three-year annual three-year outlook. Um, so we have NAVFAC here today, GSA, the Army Corps of Engineers, and finally the Coast Guard has a presentation I'm going to present for them. Um, we also have, as part of the program today, a special um, project highlight for the Army Corps of Engineers Mud Mountain job, which will be brought a couple of fellows from Kiwi here, as, as, as well as uh, um, the, the Army Corps. So now I'd like to introduce uh, Jordan Howard. Jordan came out here last year, did a great presentation, and thankfully he's agreed to come out here again this year. Um, he's out here from Washington, D.C., and he serves as Director of Federal and Heavy Construction Division at the Associated General Conference, ABC Washington, of America in Washington. He received his JD from Antonin Scalia. Yeah, that's famous guy. Recently changed names. And he earned his BA in English and Political Science from Texas Tech University. We're pleased to have him out here again. Join us in this good weather. He said, boy, every time I come out to Seattle, it's always this good weather. It must be nice here all year round. Said, yeah, you're exactly right. It's always nice. <laughs> so welcome, Jordan. Thanks. Thank you for that introduction. I just wanted to say thank you, um, ABC of Washington, for sending you for, for uh, re-inviting me. Uh, I must not have done that job last year. Uh, so my name is Jordan Howard. I head up our Federal Heavy Construction Division at ABC of America in Washington, D.C. And one of the things that I do when I'm not helping the members out is I spend roughly half my time dealing with uh, members of Congress and maybe SAB monitoring legislation, advocating for our industry, trying to kill bad ideas and promote good ideas, and the other half with federal agencies. One of the benefits of being in D.C. is that many of the, the our, our nation's federal agencies are headquartered in one town, so it's easy to just go um, from one agency to the next and say, hey, these are my ideas. These people are kicking around. What are you guys going to do? And it's also a good way just to sort of get a heads up. Um, so we'll go forward. So just, a broad overview of the realities in Washington, D.C. is definitely being shook up still. Um, we're approaching the two-year mark of uh, the new administration, and it's definitely different than things that we've seen in the past. And a lot of the career and um, uh, sort of long-standing bureaucracy within the federal government and within the agencies um, didn't know how to react for a long time. We're starting to see uh, a a formation of, of thought and consensus on, on how to approach things. Uh, one thing that is being done in D.C. is a regulatory tool is being uh, reshaped. We're seeing a lot less regulations. We're seeing agencies when they do come out with regulations to be um, extra outreach and just to make sure that things are, are, are all the I's are dotted and the T's crossed. Uh, a major executive board President Trump last year was a two for one regulation. I'm sure some of you guys have heard this. For every new regulation, we're going to get two out. Uh, that's really stifled a lot of the rights that we've seen coming out from these individual agencies. Um, there has been some clarification at um, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs saying, hey, we said, you know, if you're going to come out with a new regulation, you, you repeal two, not necessarily at the same time. Maybe say you're going to repeal those regs you know, a few years from now. But it hasn't changed any of the, uh, the mindset. Uh, we've seen a lot of agencies still so just not want to put out any regulations, which is good because we have a lot to do. Um, Congress has helped uh, as well. They use a little known tool called the uh, Congressional Review Act to uh, basically veto uh, agency rules and regulations. There was a time limit there that they, uh, I think, was used once successfully before that, and Congress even employed it uh, near, nearly three dozen times. So Congress was hitting the action. So 2019, and I know uh, we might have some questions on, um, on the election. I'll get to that towards the end. And I failed to mention at the beginning. If you have any questions, just shout them out or raise your hand. Uh, no need to wait till the end. Uh, 2019 priorities. It's gonna. You know, I, I may not say anything right now. It's you know, mind blowing. We have to see for the results of the elections. Uh, uh, DC is basically an wait and see approach. A lot of things have stalled. Uh, both houses are uh, back home campaigning after a, um, uh, a wildly productive uh, 
end of summer, so it's, it's been interesting. The advocacy challenges are still there. Uh, thin Republican majority, uh, Freedom Caucus holds a lot of weights within the House. Uh, a lot of things have to get run past them before uh, House Republicans will, will move. Depending on the election, everyone seems to agree that um, if the Republicans hold the House, that margin will shrink. We see that margin shrink. The Freedom Caucus uh, will have a much larger voice in how things are done within uh, Republican held House of Representatives, but that's just a big end. Um, again, just our uh, our system is built for compromise. It's hard to get legislation done. It's especially hard when everything's uh, polarized. But there, there has been some progress, and I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, but something that's that's not focused on Congress is the Trump administration and the agency appointees. We're still seeing record levels of vacant uh, agency positions. Uh, if, you're, if you're working at everything that you have so again a little more of a wait and see approach uh, I, like, I like this graph so a, a year ago this was much worse than it is now but uh, this sort of shows the top level uh, uh, vacancy positions within the executive branch uh, roughly half of the top level officials have still not been confirmed um, a, a sizable chunk has been nominated and then there's some, uh, on the, the right hand is just sort of some, some highlights, but it's, uh, uh, especially the deputy secretary, that's uh, a key position while we do. The secretary is usually on TV and meeting with the president, the deputy secretary has enormous uh, roles in that, how to actually get these uh, and policy initiatives off the ground and work through the agency. So, so this is a real problem uh, for the Trump administration and how to, how to get uh, the, the type of regulations and movements that they want from what is essentially the fourth branch of government. A little bit, a little bit about AGC of America's policy priorities for 2018 and 2019. Uh, I would have to say, uh, if, if there's uh, for infrastructure, I think it's our first, second, third, fourth priority. I'm sure it is the same with yours. Uh, a top of infrastructure, we have environmental permitting reform. This is a big issue. The president spoke about it in his last year of the union. Uh, his project's taking as much as 10 years to get off the ground and, and working. Um, we firmly believe that if we streamline some of the environmental permitting regulation without losing their original purpose, you can find duplicate regs that take too long. It usually has to be done right after the other. That's something that we should, uh, it, it should be bipartisan agreement as far as how to, how to streamline that. Workforce development is the number one issue within our industry. Um, there was some success with the Perkins Act. We got billions of dollars for career technical education. That's great. Um, that's not enough, so we have to keep hammering that. Uh, prior approval for a PAC, uh, civilian RAC, that's sort of a term of art of actually reducing the federal footprint. It's a bipartisan initiative. Uh, President Obama on his way out signed um, several executive orders uh, promoting this idea. President Trump has, has continued that initiative. Uh, so the federal government's the largest real estate holder uh, in the world. Uh, the government actually doesn't know how much territory and uh, properties that it owns. There's no single database that you can go to figure out what is the government on. Uh, so if there's excess property, we think that that should be sold off to the private industry and then used for redevelopment. There is a, a big need, especially with some of the locations of uh, where this uh, real estate is. Uh, I won't go through all of it, but um, kind of see that we, we're focusing on about uh, you know, 10 to 12 priority initiatives for, for next year. So infrastructure in 2019. Uh, we all, you know, by now have heard that you know, infrastructure was the one of the issues that the president was going to uh, tackle, tackle hard as a developer, uh, probably most um, credential president we have to deal with infrastructure in recent times, and uh, nothing happened, right? So we had uh, Affordable Health Care Act, sucked a lot of oxygen out, then we had tax reform, sucked a lot of oxygen out, and right after tax reform was finished, uh, at the beginning of this year, we saw this whole host of uh, uh, 
other issues coming up, uh, cut and control and integration. So it really went all of it. All, um, the ideas and the, and the initiatives kind of just scattered after those two focus uh, legislative attempts. There is now a, the talk has come back to infrastructure um, as we're getting closer. Uh, we've heard uh, the president recently say that infrastructure is an idea that uh, as recently as last week, infrastructure is an idea that he can work with on the Democrats and bipartisan. We've seen some overtures from the Democratic Party leadership uh, as well. Uh, so this on the on the left is the infrastructure priorities that came out of the White House. So this is the 1.5 trillion dollar infrastructure plan. If it can get to that. Uh, so that came out earlier this year. Uh, the Senate Dems uh, released their own plan to spend a trillion dollars for our infrastructure. Uh, a sticking point to that plan is, is essentially the repeal of all the tax reform uh, uh, laws that the Republicans have just passed and taking that money and dumping it into infrastructure. That's obviously a no-go for, for Republicans. Uh, it's going to be a poison pill. I have heard recently from the committees of jurisdiction on this issue that the Democrats uh, are likely to back off on that plan if, if they seriously pursue an infrastructure plan. Uh, and the one of the third is the outgoing chairman of the House Transportation Infrastructure Committee. It's, a, it's an important committee with our uh, industry and it's his proposal for infrastructure. So we've seen this year, uh, which we didn't see last year, actual pen on the paper plans to, to get infrastructure off the ground. So. I would say uh, the conversation is good, but we have to see where it's going. AGC, America, we have our own infrastructure plan. It's, it's, a, it's detailed what we think uh, is necessary to spend that trillion dollars and reinvest our infrastructure. Um, I won't go through all of it, but that's sort of the, uh, the lay of the land. You know, increasing gas tax for the highway trust fund, um, which they have an initiative California right now, which are standing up to repeal the, the gas tax that they just uh, voted to implement in order to reinvest in their infrastructure. Um, private activity bonds is really good for local um, infrastructure initiatives. And we have a website, again, I won't be offended if you guys go to this, especially while I'm talking, but you can write your congressman, um, letting them know that infrastructure is important to us and it's key to our uh, competitiveness as a nation. Now, Realistically, what are the prospects of infrastructure? Uh, it's tough to say. Uh, there's been more conversation about this than, than it has previously. Uh, we actually have some plans on the paper to, uh, to work with. But I would say, while we have an election in uh, less than three weeks, which I know we're all excited for, uh, the next, the presidential election has a bigger impact than midterms. Uh, so that really shrinks the window of opportunity for uh, a big, massive infrastructure plan like we all want. Um, I think if I'm here this time next year, we don't have an infrastructure plan that's sort of in the works or it's already been passed. Uh, I don't expect to see it until after the next presidential election. It's a real tight window. And for several reasons for that, um, you, know, you start looking for towards the, the next uh, presidential election, competing interests, there's less incentive to be bipartisan. It also gets I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your sentence. With infrastructure in particular, P3 would be a great alternative to government funding. Has there been any conversation in DC about that? There has. So interesting enough on the president's plan on the left, uh -huh. the goal was to turn $200 billion somehow make that into over a trillion, maybe $1.5 trillion. The only way you can get to that is through P3s. But nowhere in that document does it say a public-private partnership, which is fascinating. They essentially describe it, but they don't name it. Um, virtually everyone understands there has to be some form of P3, cost-sharing. Uh, the core is really good with that. Uh, but there's no way to get to that number without there's just not the political appetite to add another trillion dollars to that. So, so that's, that's a good question. Any others? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a tight window, realistically, probably 10 months. We don't have something off the ground. Uh, I expect if it was going to happen, 
there's going to be a strong push in the new Congress in January. We'll see a lot by that and kind of see the tea leaves. But uh, we've had, I've heard more talk of infrastructure in DC than I have in a long, long time. So that gives me reason to be optimistic. Uh, so some regulatory highlights. So I won't go through all these, but I just want to, um, and you guys will all get the PowerPoint after this. But the, uh, here's some successes, some things that have been withdrawn, blocked, rescinded, um, under review. So you have you know, the record keeping rule that would take, you know, go from six to 66 months for any uh, injury or illness, um, blacklisting rules, uh, greenhouse gas, some federal uh, projects. So many of these were, were pushed out the final months for the President, President Obama's term. And so it's been a scramble. Uh, this, I just kind of wanted to highlight here the different uh, rules and, and successes that there has been on regulatory um, reach back. So don't don't stare at this, it'll make your eyes hurt. Uh, and when you know what it is, it's probably going to hurt anyway. But this is all the steps that you need for the right to introduce the new regulation. There's um, an enormous amount of steps. I, ICF was, uh, they put this together, so if you want a copy of it, it's down there. But this is the, uh, the regulatory map, and there's so many steps. One thing you have to know about regulations is in order to repeal it, you have to uh, reverse that car the same way you, you drove it in. Uh, there's no other way to sort of fast track it. Repeal or, or rescinding some of these regulations take quite a long time. Uh, when I say regulation, uh, streamlining or reform, this is what I mean. And yet another. Uh, uh, chart that's that's got a lot. It looks like spaghetti almost. But these are all the steps that you have to do for a uh, 404 permitting, along with uh, <clears throat> Clean Water Act as well. So you see all these steps in different jurisdictions and, that are involved, and this is what's adding to a lot of the delay um, getting some of these federal projects off the ground. Uh, so it's regula regulations that AGC of America is currently working on, um, just sort of a list of things that we're keeping an eye on. Um, we all know that steel and aluminum tariffs are coming that, it, that are already implemented and any increases from that is a major issue. We've been trying to work with uh, some of the headquarters of these agencies to uh, work around or, or add some sort of buffer for, for contractors. Uh, these prices are, are very vol volatile and will jump. Uh, at a moment's notice, and this is some things that we need uh, protections from on these federal projects. Uh, some other issues like blacklisting of uh, border wall contractors, I'll, I'll talk about that, expanding by America, by America. Um, so we, we have our plate full, we're gonna keep chipping away at this. Um, for our permitting reform, we really think that, and this is some of the things that I just mentioned about streamlining, um, keeping a, a reasonable uh, approach to the environmental laws, maintaining the intent of those laws without drawing back and uh, delaying the project and delaying the work. So if you watch the news, you probably think uh, everything's not going well in Washington, D.C. and Congress can get its act together. But in fact, Congress has been more productive than it has in literally decades, right? It's kind of hard to believe. And they have done some major bipartisan legislation. Um, so here's here's just a few of those. So earlier this year, the the, uh, the Democrat and the Senate, uh, Democrat and Republican leadership got together and said, "Hey, let's do a two-year budget plan." So the budget plan is, is essentially what you have to get together before you can start spending money. Um, typically, this is done only annually, so every once a year. Uh, but this year, they said, "Let's let's do a two-year plan. We'll get this together." for 2018 and 2019, we'll say these are our top line levels of spending, which is pretty uh, pretty important because that allowed for a lot of other legislation to roll through and, and sort of grease the political wills for people. Um, so for instance, the appropriations bills, the, the, the congressional funding that funds all of our projects in the federal um, industry, so they actually got five out of the 12 appropriation bills done on time without a CR. Doesn't sound uh, impressive again until you put it in context. Uh, Congress has never sent, in the last 20 years, has never sent more than one bill fully funded and passed 
the legislature uh, before uh, the end of the fiscal year. So we've seen CRs every year without doubt. Um, so this is this is huge. And the great thing about our industry for us uh, is that they fund the major bills that uh, affect most federal contractors. You can think of energy and water. You can think of uh, military construction, veterans affairs. Those things are done, so we won't have to worry about another CR and possible um, shutdown of the government. If there was a shutdown, those projects that are already funded won't be affected. Um, so the National Defense Authorization Act is the only major piece of legislation that passes every year for the last 52 years. The great thing about this was it was passed uh, in August, again, beating the deadline. Typically, that's one of the things that falls into uh, sort of like the lame duck section, uh, November, December. We got a five-year uh, FAA reauthorization. That was a, a real political fight among, um, even among Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, they got it together and they actually extended it for its longest tenure, five years since I think the 90s. Um, I'll talk about where to, in a little bit, the Water Resources Development Act. We've got a major piece of uh, a water infrastructure passed. Uh, it's the third time that they passed it in a row. So the word it lasted for two years, so they, they did it in 2014, 2016, and 2018. So this is one of those um, I don't know, really uh, optimistic pieces of legislation that says, hey, Congress can get back together and start start doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Uh, passed a number of disaster recovery bills and passed a uh, comprehensive opioids bill, which got not a lot of press because it came out around the same time uh, the Supreme Court nominee and now Justice Brett Kavanaugh uh, was going through all of that. Uh, this is just to show you the different appropriations bills. Uh, you can see energy and water, and um, some, in the next slide you'll see some of the others. The way Congress has done this is they've actually packaged some of these appropriation bills into what they call mini buses. And it's a way to, um, to just get these through um, instead of having the vote on each individual one. Uh, the reason why the appropriations has worked this year is uh, it's cooler and calmer heads have gotten together and said, we're not gonna add any poison bills, anything that uh, is good for messaging, but we'll just tame the bill. So they've kept it relatively clean. You won't see a whole lot of uh, dramatic changes in some of these bills. Um, the next, the next one that's up is uh, is the next mini mini bus package is going to be transportation, um, and you can kind of see how it works: interior environment and financial services. Uh, so the, the big fight that everyone is talking about is this Homeland Security Appropriations Bill. And that's where you're going to start seeing um, the, uh, certain segments in the Republican Party really push for funding of, of the border wall, massive amounts of funding. You saw. Kevin McCarthy, who um, leads the House Republicans, introduced a bill to fully fund, I think, at $25 billion, uh, uh, the border wall um, with Mexico. So we're gonna see that as, as a big fight to come. Um, the rest of the appropriation bills, I think, are, are gonna be safe to have uh, 52 days to, to get the, the rest out, so we'll, we'll see. So earlier this year, Congress passed a truly record and massive disaster relief bill. Something like $89 billion was passed. And um, it's 17 billion, I guess, you know, to put it in context, the Army Corps of Engineers usually is about six billion, six to seven billion recently, sometimes five uh, billion dollars for their appropriation for the whole year. Uh, just in this one bill, the Corps got over $17 billion. And you can kind of see how it's, it's divided. 15 billion is for construction. Um, core is, is definitely uh, it's fair to say a wash and money and appropriation funds. Um, one of the things that to keep in mind or keep keep an eye out for if you're looking to do any of these Army Corps works, for, especially disaster uh, <coughs> projects, is you want to make sure when you go onto Fed uh, Biz Office, which is the official government site, is that you don't want to look just where. Uh, those solicitations are coming out. We want to see where the work is done. Um, frankly, some of these districts are, are probably going to be overwhelmed and trying to process all this work. You may have to reach out to the different uh, districts and divisions for that help. So you might see something out of the Albuquerque district advertising work in, in Houston or Galveston. Uh, that's it's not a mistake. It's just a, uh, a work, workflow issue. So just be 
be aware of it, but truly a lot of work is to come. And we're going to see plenty more um, disaster recovery bills as this goes. So the uh, water resources bill that I just mentioned, um, uh, sort of listing some of the things here you guys can look at uh, a little later. But the main point is that this is an infrastructure bill that has bipartisan support lay the groundwork for a larger infrastructure package. Uh, it's just nice to see that Congress is doing its job in a bipartisan fashion uh, on a few issues. So I mentioned this earlier. Uh, so through AGC's research and our contact with chapters, we've learned that uh, there's some cities and states that are trying to blacklist contractors, um, architects, suppliers, anyone who does work on southern border, uh, border wall. Uh, this is an issue, um, whether you're for or against the border wall, I think we can all agree that contractors should not be discriminated for doing lawful work for the federal government. Um, the agency has no position on the wall, but we don't quite seen contractors blacklisted from entire cities, counties, and possibly even states for doing work for the federal government. And you can kind of see how this would um, spiral into other issues if this is this is a uh, if this is successful. Um, there's a few cities, uh, Oakland, Berkeley, come to mind that are actively uh, that have already passed these rules. I know Oakland has been sending out notices to contractors that they find who either bid or, or do work on the wall that they're no longer welcome in Oakland and that they're blacklisted. Actually, on a public website, these companies will not do work in our city. So this is a, a concern. You can see how it, you know, maybe it's a unpopular military base uh, or uh, any sort of healthcare clinics, especially in a conservative state. You can kind of see how contractors might be pulled into this global tug of war. We think that this is, uh, uh, first of all, unconstitutional and something that has a, will have a chilling effect on, on other issues that are down the line. So we're asking the Department of Justice to take a look at this and see if uh, uh, they can uh, preempt this or, or go and ask the city, county, and states um, what's you know, to, to cease this action. So I'm getting towards the end. Uh, so the election less than three weeks. Uh, I won't do, I'll try to do any predictions. I know that's uh, what everyone says when comes talks about these things. But I can just show you the facts and really puts it into context. So as I'm sure you're aware, the, the Senate has a super slim majority for the Republicans, 51 to 49. It doesn't get better than that. Um, you've heard the, the old line that's been going around, if someone gets a, a cold or doesn't show up to work, there's no longer a majority. And it, it, essentially, that is true. Uh, just the, the thin layer of uh, how, how divided it is. Uh, then we have the House of Representatives that I'll also talk about. So first up, Senate. Uh, 26 of the 35 seats up for Democrats uh, that are running, uh, many of them in states that President Trump won. This is a tough re-election map for if you're a Senate Democrat. Uh, typically, this isn't, uh, typically, you wouldn't see such a disparity on this. Uh, this happened during, you know, six years ago, uh, President Obama's second term really uh, many Democrats rode the, those coattails and were elected in, in uh, purple states. Uh, and so that's where six years later we're seeing that they're, they're all up in a, in a different situation. So it is a tough, um, tough uphill battle in order for Democrats to take the Senate. And so here's some of the, uh, um, this chart just kind of shows where the toss ups are. Um, you can see in the middle, you know, Florida, Indiana. Montana, um, Missouri, North Dakota, Arizona. So these these are top top uh, Senate races for Democrats. You might see that the Republicans actually expand their majority um, after the election uh, in the Senate, while simultaneously losing uh, losing the House. So you can see how the vast majority of uh, sort of the toss up. Uh, districts and races are, are in Republican-held areas, uh, many of them not polling very well. The Democrats seem to be in a, in a very positive position uh, for this. 
So here's some of the toss-ups. I think um, uh, you can, if this graph you know, illustrates it even better, which is uh, how precarious the, the Republican majority in the House is. Um, you may see some, some major um, turnover. One thing I, I'd like to point out is on the lean Republican, Kathy Boris Rogers, uh, you know, Washington uh, State, Washington rep, and, uh, and also part of the leadership in the federal or in, in the Republican House. Uh, she chairs the, the Republican committee, and it's to see a leader up there and a lean Republican. That is a really bad sign for House Republicans. If your leadership is, is within a, a toss up like this. Uh, that doesn't really bode well for, for your district. So you can kind of see how everyone has, all the Republicans have such an uphill battle, and the Democrats are relatively safe. Um, so this is gonna be my last slide. Uh, so what happens after the election? Well, there's still tons of stuff for uh, Congress to, to stay active. And like I said before, we have budget appropriations still to do. We have seven approach bills that have still not um, Signed in the law, we have a farm bill. Republicans might try to do last ditch effort on uh, their tax policy and tax reform. Uh, I think everyone understands that some reform is needed. It's just a, a question of uh, using that floor space and, and when it actually uh, take place. Uh, jobs Act, and, and again, continuing nominations um, for this. But again, all this could change right after the election. Uh, so it's less than less than three weeks. So it should be. Um, relatively interesting. And that's all my all my slides. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to take them, and I'll um, be hanging out uh, afterwards. <laughs>